Hi folks, Wonia Thibault here with Buckskin Revolution and from season six of Alone. And I've been making a practice of taking some time to record a little bit more about what was going on for me behind the scenes in some of the episodes. So during episode, the break between episodes four and five, I was traveling in Alaska and I just got back from those travels a week ago today and I went straight to demonstrating hide tanning at the Oregon Country Fair for days and days, which was amazing. Really sweet to be able to present skills to a big group of people that isn't necessarily there for the skills. So a lot of the teaching I do is kind of preaching to the choir with people that are already into this stuff. So it's really neat to be able to demonstrate it in a totally different environment and an amazing, <laughs> an amazing place to be doing, doing it because it's this huge, arts and music festival with all of these traditions of zany costumes and parades coming through several times a day and people on stilts and brass bands and sequins and full body paint and everything you can imagine and there i am in my sweaty buckskins tanning hides in the hot sun and answering all kinds of questions for people who have never necessarily even seen the skin of an animal before or in any form other than finished boots or belts or what have you. So it was a pretty cool event, but it meant that I didn't get to see episode five until just a couple days ago. So I'm recording this Wednesday and the next episode comes out tomorrow. So I'm kind of under the gun here to get this posted to you guys. Um, but I wanted to take a little time to talk about some of the things that you didn't see and a little bit more details about the things that you did on episode five. So I also want to talk, this is, getting me right in the forehead. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you saw others doing, um, but I'm going to do that in a separate piece. For, for this video, I'm just going to talk about my own experience because that's what I really know. But I also want to address talking a bit about Jordan's moose kill because it seems like there's been some, there's been a lot of discussion about it in social media and some people who think it was amazing and some people who think that it was horrible. And I just want to talk a little bit more about what what big game hunting really is and and dive into some of the comments and questions about some of that stuff. So that's for something separate. So for myself, season or episode five starts at the beginning of week three. And to me, getting to week three was a bit of a turning point um, because it was like being out there really long enough to start to really feel at home and have some routines set. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was how important routines were for me out there. So I had a variety of daily routines, but I also had weekly routines and I did that with a lot of intention. So I went into my alone experience already with ideas of some of the routines that I wanted to hold for myself. And the first one was Mondays. I had designated as self-care day. So that's actually something that I was holding in my life prior for a couple months prior to that because in our busy world and with so much going on, it's really hard sometimes to remember to take time out just to care for ourselves well. And I feel like what it does for us physically, mentally, emotionally, to actually take some time for ourselves and do something good for ourselves towards our own health and happiness and well-being is really important practice. And it was something that it felt really important to me to carry on out there. So even more difficult in survival situations where you don't have food or shelter set up going in or a lot of the other things that you need for your daily living. So given that, it felt really important to me to designate a time where I just had a little bit extra attention towards self-care things. And the truth is that, of course, when you're thinking about something like being on a loan or any real intense wilderness trip, particularly when there's not food involved, it's really hard to imagine what it's gonna be like before you're out there in the field. So of course my experience out was really different than what I had pictured it being before going in, even though I've done a lot of wilderness trips and Stone Age living trips and trips with only wild food or trips where I wasn't bringing any food, this was so much more extreme and in a really different environment than I'd ever experienced before. So my idea was to have Mondays a self-care day. And when I was out, it turned out that it was a lot harder to make time and space for self-care than I had pictured just because just living and staying warm and keeping shelter up and trying to get food 
were a full-time job. I mean, every spare moment was spent on those things, but I would still hold it in my consciousness. And sometimes it looked like something as simple as stopping in the middle of the day to pull off my socks and pull out my boot liners and dry them over my fire, as opposed to waiting until the evening time to do that. Something so little, but it makes a big difference. And it's not just frivolous, it's really towards your health and well-being because taking care of your feet out there is huge. And when you're in a cold environment, but wearing something waterproof, like, like rubber boots, as I was early on, you're building up a lot of condensation in your footwear and it's easy to get cold, cold feet. And if it was colder than that, you know, frostbite or frost nip from having cold feet. So all of a sudden, instead of insulation, you have a conductor letting the cold get right at you. Also things like athlete's foot and trench foot and peeling skin and blisters, all of those can happen if you have wet feet and you're not taking adequate care of your feet. So stopping once in the middle of the day to dry my feet was a beautiful self-care task that I could do for myself that seems so basic, but was kind of a big deal to make time for. Um, Another thing, I think one of my self-care days, I decided to make a spoon rather than just eating with chopsticks um, or not having a spoon. And for me, making a spoon, and I also made a spatula, um, which were already made at, at the time of episode five, uh, to me, that was a prayer for food. That was letting the universe know that I believed that I was going to be getting more food and being set up for that food. So I made a spatula with a lovely trout shaped handle for flipping my trout that I was sure I was going to be getting and a little spoon with a lovely feather in it, which was my spruce grouse spoon. So I guess, yeah, so I guess actually I made that spoon after getting the grouse that you saw me get in episode four. Um, so those were some things that I did on self-care day. Again, not just frivolous self-care, really important to my time out, but it's so hard to make time for those projects when every moment is important for your survival that I wasn't doing it unless I had a designated time to do it. So that was a really wonderful practice that I had. Um, Saturdays were a special day because that was the start that, that marked the end of a week. I think we launched on a Sunday, which meant Saturday made one full week. So that day was always just kind of a special celebration day, like, woohoo, we made it to one week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, so, you know, those days already kind of had uh, a special thing built into them. Another very important day for me were Thursdays. And before I went out, I had already had the idea that Monday was self-care day and Thursdays were dance party days. And that felt really important to me. Seems a little silly, I know, but when you're in a survival situation, it's easy for things to feel really intense, right? And something to just lighten the mood and give you something to look forward to and remind you of just the joys of life can be huge. So I would take some time, just like 10 or 15 minutes, to go somewhere lovely and set up the camera and just just have a little groove with myself in the beautiful landscape. And I really wanted to be singing for the dance parties, but we couldn't sing any songs that, that are already produced because someone has rights to them, so they couldn't put those on the show. So I would just have dance parties in my own mind. And uh, I think I can remember where I was for the first three dance parties. They always were in a, a beautiful area and like often a time of day that was really lovely. and. The first dance party day, I danced to Billy Idol's Dancing With Myself, which was pretty fun. Um, so Thursdays, dance party days, such an important thing for me. Kept my spirits up, brought in just levity and silliness to my experience, and uh, gave me something to mark the time. So it's amazing how having routines helps the time pass faster, and then it's just whizzing by where you're like, oh my gosh, it's Thursday again. I can't believe it's time for another dance party. Great. So yeah, Thursdays were dance party days. And Mondays, or I'm sorry, let's see, Sundays and Wednesdays I designated as laundry days. So while it was still warm enough that I didn't have to wear all of my long underwear all of the time, I was able to keep up with some laundry. I had socks, I had one t-shirt, um, and I had two sets of long underwear. So I would trade one out and wash one and dry them on 
Sunday so that Monday self-care day I got to change into fresh clean clothes so that was another lovely self-care thing and then again I guess I did it Wednesday so Thursday dance party day I would have clean clothes um, so that was a nice routine and I was liking having the routines and the designated days so much that by week three and this is why I'm coming to this in this episode by week three I decided to designate Friday with a set routine as well. And I thought about it and I was like, okay, Friday food day. Now, of course, out there, every day was food day. Food was everything. It was super critical, but I wanted to set it to be something different. So it meant Fridays, I was going to try to do something ingenuitive and, and different for my food prep. So the first time I did it was, was week three. Um, and up to then I had been, you know, I had all kinds of ideas about different things to do for more food gathering. I had deadfall traps. Uh, I was working on figure four and Paiute deadfall traps and hauling flat rocks around and finding good areas to set those up. Um, none of that, none of that got covered. The conditions weren't great for that kind of trapping where I was. Um, and I'll go into that more once I know whether or not they're going to actually show that because I don't want to give any spoilers. Um, so because I was working on other means of getting food, fishing and deadfall traps and hunting with my bow, I hadn't gotten to snaring yet, partly because I didn't have snare wire. Another thing is that I really wasn't sure whether or not there were a lot of rabbits in the area at first because I wasn't seeing any and there certainly was rabbit poop in the area but it was really hard to tell if it was fresh or not. It looked pretty old and weathered to me. So I didn't have clear indication that there were definitely rabbits because while we had had a lot of snow it wasn't snow that stuck long enough for me to see a lot of tracks up to that point. Um, but starting starting that week we were starting to get some snow that was really sticking but before that happened one night and I believe it was a Thursday night I was out at dusk cutting some poles for my shelter and I felled a last tree and it was getting dark enough and I'd been working hard enough and long enough I decided to leave that tree down and to come back for it in the morning when I came back for it the next morning right on top of the trunk was a bunch of fresh rabbit poop. So, jackpot. Now I know that there is rabbit activity right in that area. So even though I didn't have snare wire, I decided it was time to start snaring. So first Friday food day, week three, I decided that I'm going to set some snares. So it was, it was snowing pretty good while I was out setting them. It was the first like real thick and heavy snowstorm that we had. And uh, I set two snares that night. So one I set like I would have if I had had snare wire. So what I had was 20 pound test fishing line and it was monofilament because monofilament was the only kind we were able to bring. So if I had had a braided Kevlar fishing line, that would have been a little harder for rabbits to snip, but monofilament is gonna be really easy for them to snip. And that was all I was allowed to bring and 20 pound test was the was the highest poundage that we were allowed to bring. So I used my strongest fishing line. I set up one snare in what was clearly a rabbit trail, just tied onto a piece of brush. And then for the other one, I set a spring pole snare. So I'm gonna go into more detail about my exact techniques for the spring poles and do a demonstration with another video because I don't want this to be too long. So I'm just gonna kind of give a gloss over description of it. So. The thing with fishing line is, again, rabbits can snip it off. And so I knew that it was likely that unless I got a rabbit up and off of its feet in my snare, it would probably just be able to nip its way out of a snare. So the trick with the spring pole is that they were very difficult to set up where I was because most of the ground around there was either bedrock or huge jumbled quartz rocks, none of which you can drive stakes into, or sphagnum moss, which might be that thick, but just super loose and fluffy and doesn't hold a stake at all. So there were not very many areas where there was actual soil that was deep enough before you got to the bedrock that I could drive stakes into the ground and have them strong enough to hold the tension of a bent sapling. So 
for my spring pole snares, what I did was had two uprights of hooked sticks. So I'd cut those out of a, a piece that had a branch coming off to get my hooks. And then I would cut another piece that was the exact distance between my two uprights. And then I would flatten the ends of my cross piece and make a little very shallow divot where the hooks of my upright poles, my vertical poles would sit. And then I would take a piece of paracord, which I ended up bringing last minute instead of snare wire. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So I'd take a piece of paracord and I would tie it to the top of a sapling and then I would bend it just enough to give me just the amount of force that I wanted, which was just enough to get a rabbit up and off of its feet, but not so much force that it would pull my uprights up out of the ground. So I'd tie that sapling with paracord and then I would tie the end of the paracord to the middle of my cross piece that was held between my two hooked uprights. And then once that was all set and holding well and I got the tension adjusted just right, then I would take a piece of fishing line and tie it to the middle of the cross piece dangling down into the middle of the rabbit trail. And I would tie that with two overhand knots, one to give me my noose so it would be sliding and cinching, and then another one which served to hold that loop open a little bit. But here's the trick. Snare wire has a lot of its own tension, so you can mold it and it stays in shape. Fishing line is very loose and floppy, so it was hard to get a loop. It just wanted to close or turn sideways, not a stable loop like snare wire would have been. So what I had to do was find some means to hold that loop open and rigid in the middle of the trail, right where I wanted it. Otherwise, a rabbit could just nose right around it and or go under it or, you know, any way to avoid it and not get caught. So I ended up using my one major superpower for my snaring. And that superpower is the fact that I went gray at around 25. So I have had a lot of gray hair for a long time in my life, which can be kind of a bummer. People think you're a lot older than you are, it kind of ages you before your time. You know, our culture has all of this stuff about, about gray hair. I've adjusted to it. I'm all right with my gray hair now most of the time, but out there, it was, it was my special secret superpower. So what I did was I would grab a piece of my lovely white hair, like this one, pull it out, and that white hair is transparent. It blends in with the landscape and it blends in amazingly to snow being white. So I would take one of my hairs and I would tie it to one side of my fishing loop noose, and then I would tie the other to my upright pole. So I would do that on either side. So now that loop is in the exact middle of the rabbit trail at the exact right height for the rabbit and the exact right size for its head to go through, but not its waist. So you wanna make sure you get them by the neck, ideally. And then to hold it so that the rabbits couldn't nose under them and to keep it stable in the middle of the trail, I would take a third piece and I would tie it to the bottom of my loop. And then I would tie the end of it to another little stick that I would just dig into the trail. So now that loop of fishing line is held in three directions. So it's exactly in the middle of the trail. And the beauty of the hair is that not only is it really thin and really difficult to see, so it blends in really well, but it's also really, really weak. So it's just strong enough to hold that loop open, but then weak enough that just the force of the rabbit walking through it is gonna break it. That was really key. If it was super strong, then it would just hold the loop open and then the rabbit could just pass on through or wouldn't have the force to open the spring pole. So that was my technique and Amazingly, the very first time I set up a snare, I got a rabbit the next day, which was why I was so thrilled and so surprised in episode five when I went and there was my rabbit hanging in midair. I figured that it might take a little while for me to get a rabbit with that technique, and I wasn't even sure if it was gonna work with the fishing line. I'd never snared with fishing line before, so my first snare out, I got a rabbit, and it was amazing and definitely a game changer for me. So it was very, very exciting indeed. Um, which brings me, oh, let's see, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say why I brought paracord instead of snare wire at the last minute. So I had most of my 10 items chosen and I was determined on snare wire. 
So the only cordage I was going to have was my fishing line and my snare wire, and I was planning to use those for whatever I needed and for my shelter and whatnot. But our base camp before launch, the weather was already so intense driving snow sleet really cold and really intense winds that were regularly threatening to knock over the wall tents that we were staying in at base camp given that i was picturing snare wire in a shelter and the bending back and forth that they would do in these gale force arctic winds and i thought to myself that's not going to work for my shelter and then i thought you know what in the history of this show no one has ever been shown to get something with snare wire. To my knowledge, no one had ever successfully snared anything. I don't have a lot of experience snaring, so am I going to be the first one, even without experience, versus knowing that paracord would be hugely important for shelter and so many other things? So at the last minute, I switched out snare wire for paracord and I'm glad I had the paracord, but I cannot tell you how many times I was so bummed not to have snare wire. I mean, all day, every day, really. Because the things that I needed to do to trap with fishing line were so much more intense than had I had snare wire. So I mentioned that I set up one snare with my fishing line as I would have. Was it snare wire? Well, the next day, that, that loop had been sprung. It was cinched down and the rabbit had nipped that off and left it on the ground. So I was right that fishing line without a spring pole mechanism wasn't going to cut it. So what that meant is that while with snare wire I could have set a snare anywhere I saw a rabbit trail, all I would have needed was something to tie it to. It could be a root or a rock or a tree of any size. It would have been easy to set them anywhere. Instead, I had to have an area one that had soil deep enough to drive my posts and really hold them Two, a sapling nearby that was small enough with just the right amount of spring to lift the rabbit up but not pull my pegs out and three all of those things had to be right on an active rabbit trail and that was a tall order and then once there was snow on the ground and the ground was starting to freeze, it was a much taller order indeed. And that's not to mention, you know, all of the carving and getting just right, those two hooks and the, and the cross piece, all just the right dimensions. That's really relatively easy, but having all of those conditions was really limiting. So none of that would have been the case with snare wire. Um, so that's snaring, which brings me to the rabbit rope you saw me making. So I have raised rabbits for many years for meat. So I've tanned a ton of rabbit hides in my life, but wild rabbit is way thinner than domestic rabbit. And even domestic rabbit can be really hard to tan without holes because it's a very thin hide. But I was raising my rabbits a little older than most people do with meat rabbits specifically so I could get really good meat and really good fur. That's another story. So wild rabbits just too darn thin to tan generally without them tearing apart and then even if they are tanned, are tanned they tend to be super weak. So what peoples who really relied on rabbits for food and warmth tended to do was make these rabbit ropes and then weave with them. So personally I was familiar with rabbit rope from the Paiute people tradition who were native people of the Great Basin Desert. So uh, southeastern Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, that's all Great Basin Desert. And uh, those people would make amazing huge rabbit nets that they would work on generation after generation. They would add to these rabbit nets. So they were family heirlooms that were passed down and they would string people out on the nets and then have the rest of the family group go out and beat the brush to drive the rabbits into the nets. So they got a lot of rabbit at once. And then they would make these rabbit ropes and then weave with those and those would be blankets to keep themselves warm in the winter. And the Great Basin Desert can get very cold, sub-zero, driving winds. So these were a really important survival item for people. Uh, so. All of my understanding was that the way people generally made them was starting at the eyeball and working down in a spiral and I didn't find that to work very well. So I, I ended up cutting from the legs up. So the way I skinned the rabbit was I case skinned it, which means I started, started at the anus and worked out towards each leg and then around each back foot. So I had just one slit and then working the hide up and off of the rabbit in a tube. 
and then I would very thoroughly membrane the hide using my fingers, occasionally my knife, but you, mostly just my fingernails because the hide is so thin you can, you can accidentally cut it really easily. So taking all of the membrane off, and that has some fat in it. You hear people talk about how you need to singe the hair off of an animal to get all of the fat, and I believe that if you're doing a really good job of membraning the hide, you're getting most of the fat through that. You're not really losing any through not eating the skin. Um, more on that later. Um, so, in a later episode. Um, so, cleaning the skin really thoroughly, and then I was cutting up, and you saw me working with my scissors to cut the hide into a spiral on episode five, and I very, very quickly switched over from the scissors on my Leatherman to my knife, because with the scissors, you're cutting the hair, so you're losing a lot of the fluff, and you could see kind of some of the fluff coming off in the wind as I was doing that. So I switched over to a knife because with the knife, you're cutting just the skin and not the hair, which is what I wanted. I want maximum fluff. And then once you have it cut into a long spiral, you're twisting the hide. And when you twist it, the nature of the hide is that that wet hide side flips to the inside and the drier fuzzy side flips to the outside. So you've got essentially this twisted rope with all of the hide side in and the fur side out. So that when it dries, it's this amazing, big, fluffy, long rope. And it's like, it's like the biggest, fluffiest, most amazing ball of yarn you'll ever see in your life. So that was so awesome. I was so excited about my rabbit rope. And of course, I cannot say any more about the intentions or what happened with that rabbit rope because I can't give any spoilers. So you will just have to keep watching to see if any rabbit rope projects came to fruition. Um, but yeah, that rabbit was amazing. Particularly myself, I have a really deep connection to rabbits. I was born in the year of the rabbit and I raised rabbits for many years. And I guess, uh, I guess I just kind of connect with the, the energy of the rabbits as well. And the kind of like sweet and, you know, passive and fuzzy, but also super fierce. If you've ever read Watership Down, you'll know that rabbits can be very fierce when needed, which you also learn when you raise rabbits, because sometimes those suckers can be feisty and they'll thump with their back feet on, on the ground if, if you're doing something that they're not into. So um, yeah, rabbits, definitely, definitely a, a powerful medicine for me, um, both from eating them because I depended on rabbits as my main meat source for many years when I was raising them and, you know, astrologically and energetically and in so many ways. So huge, huge deal for me and big game changer once I started snaring. And uh, yeah, yeah, we will watch the story unfold and uh, see what more might come from that. And um, yeah, I think that's most of what I wanted to cover. Um, trying to keep these from being too long. So would rather release more of them in shorter segments so you don't have to wade through a bunch of crap that you don't want to hear me talk about. Maybe no one wanted to hear me talk about the Oregon Country Fair, but I just came from it. It was really fun and exciting. And at the very end of my Oregon Country Fair time, here's more stuff I'm going to make you listen to because you're still watching. The very last night, my friends and I wandered into a silent disco and it was amazing. We were just on our way to the sauna, not sure what we were up to that night. And then we walk up to this whole street of people that are just super jamming and it's completely silent. And then there's someone handing out headphones and I got a pair of headphones with these bright glowing red bunny ears on them, which is kind of interesting because it was the bunny episode and I didn't even know that at the time because I didn't watch the episode until I got back from the country fair. So there I am. And it was an amazing DJ, like live DJ in these headphones. And we ended up just dancing in the streets to the silent disco for literally hours as like the capper to three days of teaching thousands of people about hide tanning. And it was awesome. So that is me on episode five and silent discos. Huge thumbs up. Oh my God, if I could have had glowing bunny ear headphones for my dance parties on Thursdays while I was out on alone, whoa. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, so stay tuned to more of these talks about things I was up to on alone and things I'm noticing about other times on alone. Um, and also I have a bunch of other videos because I do a lot of things besides just what you saw on alone. So uh, I'm putting out a lot of videos about a lot of the ancestral skills that I do and have been teaching and practicing for the last 25 years or so. So take a look and subscribe. It's a big help to me to have more subscribers and it helps you know when I'm putting out more content right away. So yeah, thanks so much everyone. Thanks for joining in my journey and wanting to hear a more rounded story about it all.